Welcome to Aileron Safety and Health Orientation. During this training, you will learn about various workplace hazards and how to mitigate the risk of potential injury. Aileron Group is made up of many different companies, including Acara, which specializes in staffing acquisition, and Broadleaf, which specializes in providing total talent solutions to our clients. You've been instructed to take this training by Acara or Broadleaf as a condition of employment due to OSHA regulations, which you'll learn more about later in the training. Here's a brief agenda of what we'll be covering today. First, an introduction to today's training. Then we'll discuss general safety, workplace hazards, machine and vehicle safety, fall prevention and protection, and fire prevention and evacuation. Aileron Group is committed to ensuring the safety of its employees. We believe that no job or task is important enough to risk one's health or safety. We recognize that potential hazards may exist in the workplace, but we believe that accidents are preventable when reasonable care is taken and control measures are implemented. In accordance with the Occupational Safety and Health Act, also known as OSHA, every employer has a responsibility to ensure that the workplace is free from all recognized hazards that are likely to cause harm or even death. Since Aileron and its customers are joint employers, both have the responsibility to maintain a safe environment. Training of temporary workers is a shared responsibility. Aileron provides general safety and health training. It's our customer's responsibility to provide site-specific training, highlighting any workplace hazards and provide PPE. Employees assigned to work at a customer work site are expected to comply with their safety rules and regulations as a condition of employment. Accountability. A safety and health accident prevention program is unforceable without a disciplinary policy. Employees who knowingly violate safety rules or procedures and put themselves or others in danger are subject to disciplinary action up to and including termination of employment. For most objects weighing less than 50 pounds, follow these basic lifting procedures. Before starting a lift, be sure your footing is secure, inspect your surroundings, remove obstacles, and plan your route. Place hands to avoid pinch points and bumping hazards to prevent smashing, bruising, and crushing fingers when setting down a load. Test the load to determine the weight. Seek help or use a mechanical lifting device if the load is too heavy. Keep knees flexed, never locked when lifting. Pick up loads without twisting your torso or bending at your waist. Keep yourself square to the load to prevent back strain and change positions with your feet. Work between waist and shoulder height when possible. This minimizes stress on the back. If the load is below waist level, lower your body by bending your knees and keep your back straight. Pick up the load, move it to waist level, and stand, using your legs to lift rather than your back. Keep your knees flexed and avoid bending over the load. Carry the load at waist level and put it down at waist level if possible. If placing the load above waist level, bend your knees to lower your body first. Then place the load while keeping your back as straight as possible. If a load is estimated to weigh more than 50 pounds, obtain assistance or, if authorized, use a mechanical lifting device such as a dolly or a mechanical lift. Advise your aileron representative if you've been instructed to lift over 50 pounds unassisted. Lifting any object in excess of 50 pounds unassisted is not permitted and violates aileron safety policy. Repetitive strain injury, also known as RSI, is cumulative trauma disorder caused by prolonged, repetitive, forceful, or awkward movements. The result is damage to muscles, tendons, and nerves of the neck, shoulder, forearm, and hand, which can cause pain, weakness, numbness, or impairment of motor control. The primary warning sign of RSI is pain in the upper extremities, such as the fingers, palms, wrists, forearms, and shoulders. The pain may be burning, aching, or shooting. It could be local in the fingertips or dispersed in the entire forearm. RSI can be prevented in the workplace by either taking frequent breaks to walk around, 
get a drink of water, stretch tight muscles, and look out the window at a far object to rest your eyes. Use good posture. If you can't hold good posture, it probably means it's time for you to take a break. If you consistently struggle to maintain good posture, you may need your workstation evaluated for adjustment. It can also be beneficial to develop some of the muscles that support good posture. Use an economically optimized workstation to reduce strain on your body. Regular exercise, including strengthening, stretching, and aerobic exercises can also help reduce the risk of RSI. Always keep the wrist joint straight. This allows the big muscles in your arm, shoulder, and back to do most of the work instead of the smaller, weaker, and more vulnerable muscles in your hand and wrist. Realize that you're not invincible. RSI can happen to you, so do not be afraid to ask for help. When safely working with any electrical equipment, you should obey the electrical hazard warning signs, keep electrical equipment away from water and dampness, never use electrical equipment if your hands are moist, even from perspiration, Make sure equipment is properly grounded. Do not remove the third prong on a cord to make it fit in an outlet. Work on electrical circuits must be performed by a licensed contractor or trained maintenance department member. Hazards exist in the workplace in many different forms. Sharp edges, falling objects, flying sparks, chemicals, noise, and a lot of other potentially dangerous situations. When other means don't provide enough protection, personal protective equipment, also known as PPE, is provided and required. Types of PPE include bump caps, protective footwear, eye or face shields, gloves, rubber sleeves, reflective vest, chemical resistance apron, cold weather protection, earmuffs or earplugs, dust mask, or respirator. You'll be required to attend training sessions on PPE, properly wear PPE according to training, care for, clean, and maintain PPE, inform a supervisor if PPE needs repair or replacement. Also notify your supervisor if your PPE is uncomfortable to wear and is not a good fit for you. Report to your Aileron representative if you do not have access to proper PPE that is needed on site. Remember, PPE cannot be the first protection option, does not prevent an accident from happening, does not eliminate the hazard, and only reduces exposure or the severity of injury or illness. You must immediately notify your customer supervisor and aileron representative when you feel a hazardous or potentially unsafe condition exists that could cause injury or property damage. Examples might include working on machinery that's not properly guarded or not being provided with the right personal protective equipment for the work environment. If a customer requests that you do a new work task or work in a new environment, different safety policies rules and procedures may apply and require additional training. Injuries occurring while on the job, including minor cuts or strains, must be immediately reported to your customer supervisor and your aileron representative at the time of the incident. Accident investigations will be conducted on reported injuries and injured employees must assist with investigation. Based on aileron's policy in alignment with the customer requirements, Post-accident drug and alcohol testing may be required. It's your responsibility to ensure that chemicals are properly labeled, stored properly, and that you are aware of the limitations. Every container must have a label. Never remove or deface these labels. The label reflects what's in the container. Follow storage directions on labels. Ensure that containers are properly sealed. Do not store chemicals in break room refrigerators. Only trained personnel are authorized to handle chemicals. Notify your manager if you're allergic or sensitive to certain chemicals. Safety data sheets, also known as SDS, list details on chemical and physical dangers, safety procedures, and emergency response techniques. Our clients must provide SDS for each hazardous chemical available to you. Please make sure you know the location of the SDS. 
If you're concerned about a hazard, please contact your supervisor. Bloodborne pathogens are infectious microorganisms present in blood that can cause disease in humans and can spread at the point of contact. Aileron does not permit any positions that involve regular exposure to blood or other bodily fluids. However, you should have general knowledge on how to protect yourself in unusual circumstances. If you identify a biohazard like spilled blood, isolate the area and report it immediately, being careful not to touch the blood. Remember that only properly trained employees are authorized to clean up biohazard spills. Do not handle broken glass or sharp objects such as razors or needles with your bare hands. Don't handle bloody materials, even if they seem dry. Never use your hands or feet to push down the trash in a bag, box, or can. It could contain sharp objects that could puncture your hands or feet. Never hug trash to your body. It could contain sharp objects or fluids that could leak on you. If you have a possible exposure to a bloodborne pathogen, identify how you may have been in contact with potentially infectious bodily fluid. Wash the area with water, using soap if possible. Vigorously scrub all areas to remove contaminants from the skin. If you have an open wound, squeeze it gently to make it bleed and wash with soap and water, and notify your supervisor immediately. Accidents in confined spaces are a frequent cause of severe injuries and fatalities. A confined space is an area that it's difficult to get in and out of and can be hazardous. They're usually marked with warning signs because getting out of a confined space can be difficult in an emergency and even deadly. Employees must not enter confined spaces for any reason unless you're properly trained and authorized to do so by your supervisor. Entry means when a person passes through an opening into a permit required confined space and performs work activities in that space. Technically, entry occurs as soon as any part of the body enters the space. It's natural to want to help someone stuck in a hazardous situation or who's injured. However, due to the danger involved and the knowledge and expertise required, rescue of those inside a confined space must only be conducted by trained emergency response personnel. Your job is to immediately communicate the situation and get help. Entering the confined space to attempt rescue can endanger your own life and make the emergency responder's job even more difficult and dangerous. Manual hand tools are powered by hand and include anything from axes to wrenches. Powered hand tools include electric, pneumatic, hydraulic, gas-powered, powder-actuated tools, from power drills to portable grinders. The greatest hazards posed by manual and powered tools result from misuse and improper maintenance. Machine-related injuries are some of the worst in the industry today. Workers get caught in machines and suffer severe injuries such as crushed arms, legs, severed fingers, or blindness, and some are even killed. Injuries like these can be prevented by the use of machine guards, which shield operators and nearby workers from injury. If your job activities involve operating machinery equipped with machine guards, never remove or tamper with guards. Machine guards protect you from harm by preventing any part of your body or clothing from making contact with dangerous moving parts, or protecting you from objects falling into moving parts and becoming deadly projectiles. Use equipment only for its intended purpose. Never operate equipment, company vehicles, forklifts, machines, power tools, welds, cranes, and hoists, and other lifting devices, unless you're trained and authorized to do so. Forklift operation requires forklift certification. A lockout is when a lock is placed on the power switch to a piece of equipment so that it cannot be turned on to prevent hazards during servicing or maintenance. Lockout tagout, also known as LOTO, can only be done by employees with advanced training as provided by the customer. A lockout could consist of a lock applied to a control such as switch, breaker, or valve. A tag containing words such as danger, do not operate, may also be used for lockout identification. If you see the lock and or the tag applied to an energy control device, do not operate the equipment or machine. Contact your customer supervisor for further instruction. 
Know how to start and stop your machine and identify all safety devices and emergency stops prior to operation. When using cranes, hoists, or lifting devices, you must receive special training and have prior authorization. If your job activities involve the use of this type of equipment, Inspect cranes, hoists, and lifting devices prior to each use, and never use damaged or improperly secured equipment. Never walk under a load suspended from a hoist or crane. Keep personnel clear of the crane or hoist's fall zone, and know the weight of the material being lifted, and never overload a crane or a hoist. Employees must obtain authorization from their aileron representative before operating a customer vehicle. Always wear your seatbelt in the correct manner while operating the vehicle. Obey traffic laws, signs, and signals. Cooperate with law enforcement and drive with attention to the behavior of other drivers in the immediate area. Be aware of pedestrians and allow them the right of way. Inspect the vehicle before and after daily use. Do not use cell phones or other communication devices while driving. Immediately report traffic violations, citations, or accidents to your customer supervisor and aileron representative. Never operate a motor vehicle while under the influence of drugs or alcohol, or if you are not licensed, authorized, or physically able to do so. Thousands of disabling injuries and even deaths occur each year as a result of slips, trips, and falls from heights on stairs, on level ground. These injuries occur at work and at home. It's important for you to be able to recognize workplace slip, trip, and fall hazards to prevent conditions and acts that cause slips, trips, and falls. You can prevent injury by promptly cleaning up leaks or spills on floors, stairs, and entryways, and on loading docks. Reporting floor problems such as lifted carpet, broken planks, and loose tiles. Blocking off and marking floor areas undergoing cleaning or repair. Keeping cords, power cables, and air hoses out of walkways. Keeping drawers closed when not being actively used. If you're assigned to a manufacturing facility with designated traffic lanes, walk only in marked traffic lanes is required. Protective barriers such as floor opening covers, guardrail systems, and safety nets are put into place to prevent employees from being exposed to hazards involving falls from heights. These measures are essential to preventing falls from heights and should never be modified or removed. On stairs and dock edges, walk, don't run, on stairs and hold on to railings at all times when going up or down the stairs and do not carry objects in both hands. Don't jump on or off platforms or loading docks and stay away from edges. Don't carry a load you can't see over, especially on stairs or around dock edges. Report missing or broken stair rails, as well as slippery and damaged treads. When performing work at heights, there is a potential for injury not only to those performing this work, but also to employees working nearby. Falling objects are of particular concern. Only designated train employees are permitted to work at heights that require a personal fall arrest system, also known as PFAS. A personal fall arrest system is complex and essential to the safety of trained employees, therefore should not be used or even handled by untrained employees. Should an employee using a PFAS require rescue, only designated authorized rescuers that have been trained by a competent rescuer or rescue equipment and procedures can provide such assistance. If necessary, 911 will be called for assistance. Before using a ladder, remember the following. Check that steps or rungs are tight and secure and that hardware and fittings are securely attached. Look for bends, breaks, or cracks in metal ladders. Report ladders found with defects to your customer supervisor. Do not use a ladder that has a tag indicating it's defective or removed from service. Read maximum load tag. Do not load ladders beyond their maximum intended load or rated capacity. When using a ladder, use ladders only for their designated purpose. Use ladders only on stable and level surfaces unless secure to prevent accidental movement. Don't shim or prop. And keep areas clear around the top and bottom. Do not carry objects or loads that could cause loss of balance and falling. Never reach beyond arm length when working on the ladder. 
One on ladder, be sure to use the handrail and maintain three points of contact with the ladder at all times, meaning two feet and one hand. Never stand above the second to last step of the ladder. Preventing fires can be done by controlling ignition sources and practicing good housekeeping. To control ignition sources, ensure proper maintenance is performed on equipment and systems. Remove combustibles and debris like wood and paper. Detect fuel leaks and attach a ground new wire to containers when transferring materials to prevent static electricity. To practice good housekeeping, maintain neatness by keeping work areas free of debris, free of unused or excess flammable and combustible materials such as oil, grease, and solvents. Always know your exit strategy. In the event of a declared emergency or drill requiring immediate evacuation from the building, exit the building in a calm and orderly manner as soon as possible. If you hear an alarm or are notified by a representative or security officer to evacuate the premises, you should stop all work, turn off all electrical equipment or machines, and secure classified material if applicable. Walk to the nearest exit proceed to the pre-designated emergency evacuation assembly area and wait for further instructions from your facility representative. Do not re-enter the facility unless instructed to do so by the appropriate facility representative. This completes the video portion of the training. You can now proceed to the second part of the training, which includes completing the safety quiz on all of the topics covered in this training. The training is not complete until you've completed the quiz. Please contact your Aileron representative if you need further information. Thank you.